offers us the following reflection on faith. Faith is born of an encounter with the living God who calls us and reveals his love, a love which precedes us and upon which we can lean for security and for building our lives. Transformed by his love, we gain fresh vision, new eyes to see. We realize that it contains a great promise of fulfillment and that a vision of the future opens before us. Faith, received from God as a supernatural gift, becomes for us a light for our way, guiding our journey through time. My brothers, we hear the same central themes of faith echoed in the introduction to the Ratio Formationis Franciscani where we hear these words. Franciscan formation is based upon a personal encounter with the Lord and begins with the call of God and the individual's decision to walk with St. Francis in the footsteps of the poor and crucified Christ as his disciples under the action of the Holy Spirit. The ratio goes on. Franciscan formation is a continuous process of growth and conversion involving the whole of a person's life, called to develop his own particular human, Christian, and Franciscan dimensions, radically living the Holy Gospel in the spirit of prayer and devotion in fraternity and minority. My dear brothers, may the Lord give you peace. Welcome to this International Congress on Franciscan Formation, organized by the General Secretariat for Formation and Studies, with the assistance of friars from around the Franciscan world. Before continuing with my reflection, I would like publicly to give thanks to God for the gift that each of you are to the order to the church, and to the world. Most of you, my dear brothers, are engaged directly in the work of permanent and initial formation within the order. You are precious instruments of the Spirit of God, agents and protagonists of the call to universal holiness in which our specific Franciscan evangelical way of life participates and is most clearly understood. You are brothers who by your life, work, and example stand as symbols of faith, hope, and love to which all of us are called. Those of you engaged directly in the work of permanent and initial formation are the first among us to be evangelized evangelizers, living witnesses to the resurrected Jesus, who meets his beloved on the road of life, so that they, so that we, might become the very presence and love of God to one another, to the church, to the world, and to the entire created universe. By your commitment to the specific ministry of Franciscan formation, you have placed yourselves totally at the disposition of God proclaiming to us that it is possible to live the challenge of the Magnificat, Mary's unconditional yes to God, and to do so through our specific form of vita, the gospel life lived in fraternity and minority. I also wish to thank those who have accepted the call of the order to serve as animators of evangelical formation within and across the order. To our General Secretary, Brother Vidal Rodriguez Lopez, who is the head of our vacation trip these days. Our Assistant Secretary, Brother Sergius Valdina, and their Administrative Assistants, Brother Adriano Busato, who is preparing 
making special plans for special trips these days. My dear brothers, you have given gener generously of yourselves in the service to the Universal Brotherhood. For this, and for many, the many ways you have served the brothers of the Order in your respective provinces, or at other levels of life in the Order, I extend to you the gratitude of the General Definitorium and of all the brothers of the Order. And I think an applause is worthy here. Thanks also to all who participated in the Continental Congresses, which provided opportunities for you to re for your respective conferences to reflect on the current state of Franciscan formation at the local and regional levels, the challenges and opportunities in attempting to incarnate the central themes and principles within specific cultural and ecclesial contexts. These continental efforts have provided much food for thought and will serve the participants in this international congress. Also a word of gratitude to our support staff of Friars who are hidden or perhaps hiding in boxes above us in the back, doing translations, those who will be doing textual translations to our communication specialists, to all of you, I extend a word of gratitude on behalf of the Order. As all of you know, the experience of Franciscan life must be lived and developed within the local realities of your entities, while at the same time remaining open to dialogue with other entities at such levels as interprovincial, conference-wide, continental, and in and through international encounters. Ultimately, our meeting together is not simply to produce another document or well-intentioned reports, which can be published and then conveniently filed away on the shelves of our priority libraries or archives, together with a multitude of other documents from the order. We know what those documents look like, Many of them still have their plastic wrappings on them in our libraries. Rather, the purpose of our gathering together at this Congress is to reflect deeply on what actually is transpiring within our formation, structures, and practices, to place these before critical eyes of discernment, and to search for better, more effective, and relevant ways to achieve the goals of the entire formation process. This Congress is about conversion and transformation. If it is to achieve its greatest and highest goal, we must go very deep within ourselves, deep within an analysis of the actual state of our life and witness, deep within an analysis of the current state of the world, the church, and the order, so that we might allow the Spirit of God to lead us to new places, giving us the courage to go where the order perhaps never before has ventured, or from where it has since withdrawn at its own peril. At the same time, our meeting together as brothers, as formators, provides us a unique opportunity to walk together on the same Emmaus journey, the gospel life, with the brothers serving in leadership positions in the government of the order, and with the brothers from all regions of the Franciscan world. This diversity of experiences, these reflections and context-specific applications of the Ratio provide us a unique opportunity to share what the Lord Jesus is doing in and through us, to draw courage from one another, to listen and to learn from one another's experiences, and thus become more engaged and more sensitive to the working of the Spirit in the hearts and minds of one another, especially those who have been entrusted into our paternal care through the formative process. Even now, we are being challenged to analyze and discern 
the movement of the Spirit of God among God's people. This same call challenges us to deepen our understanding of the new technologies and emerging and competing understandings of the human person. The impact of these on young men who might consider accepting the call to Franciscan religious life in the church and the types of adaptations and updating that we will be required to undertake in order to transmit the good news of Jesus Christ, the witness of the church, and the beauty and relevancy of our gospel way of life to the people of our times. Authenticity of life, openness to diversity and complexity, attention to the unique gifts and experiences of each and every candidate, postulant, novice, and professed fire, and the living out of a more radical manner, in a more radical manner, simplicity of life in minority and poverty. It is to these values and goals that we must dedicate greater attention, resources, reflection, and the development of concrete ways to make ever more visible the gospel in our individual and fraternal lives, in our structures, our prayer, and our missionary witness. That's who our brother, our Vicar General Julio, to continue. El tema central de este encuentro es acompañamiento franciscano, criterio formativo. El texto bíblico de fondo narra la historia del capítulo 24 de Lucas, que se refiere con los detalles precisos al proceso del encuentro que conduce a un cambio de vida entre el Señor Jesús resucitado y los discípulos cristianos que estaban en crisis, una crisis que era a la vez humana y espiritual, personal y comunitaria. Estas dos, estos dos discípulos que estaban dejando Jerusalén, hablando entre sí de los hechos de los que fueron testigos directos y también hablaban de las historias de otros miembros de la protocomunidad cristiana de Jerusalén, es muy probable que que experimentaron un profundo sentido de confusión interna y desconcierto por lo que había sucedido en la vida de Jesús de Nazaret, su Mesías, tanto tiempo esperado. Probablemente estaban recorriendo toda su experiencia con Jesús, su vida, sus enseñanzas, su ministerio milagroso, su efecto carismático con la muchedumbre. Y es casi seguro que trataban de entender el significado de todas estas experiencias con la esperanza de encontrarles un sentido en la oscuridad de la crucifixión de su Señor. La narración que hace Lucas de los acontecimientos de la pasión, muerte y sepultura de Jesús de Nazaret revela la, la decepción y la desilusión que estos dos discípulos, al igual que muchos otros, sintieron en lo más profundo de sus corazones. Estos hechos podrían interpretarse como una derrota de la vida y la misión de Jesús, una misión que ahora estaba encomendada a los apóstoles, los discípulos y otros seguidores de Jesús, a la naciente comunidad cristiana, a la Iglesia. Es igualmente plausible que su relación con el Señor Jesús, todavía vivo, les había llevado a tomar decisiones radicales para abrirse permanentemente a la propuesta del Evangelio de Jesús. Opciones que para ellos y para nosotros suponen un compromiso con un programa permanente de conversión y transformación. Frente a una tal derrota y la, la, potención, la potente aniquilación de la experiencia de Jesús, algo nuevo ha sucedido a los discípulos y seguidores de Jesús. Jesús regresa a ellos de una manera nueva y no todavía comprendida. 
encontrando a los discípulos, es decir, encontrando a nosotros en el camino de la vida. ¿Verdad? Él acompaña a cada discípulo de manera personal y de manera personalizada, acogiéndolos, ayudándole a ver con claridad cuáles son los valores que, se, que guían su existencia, la manera que el proyecto evangélico de Dios pueda ser realizado en ellos a través de ellos mismos, personalmente y comunitariamente. Los discípulos de Maús caminan con Jesús, así como Jesús camina con ellos. Llevan a cabo un itinerario juntos, abriéndose el uno al otro mutuamente, discípulo con discípulo, discípulos con Jesús, Jesús con discípulos. In this way, the Emmaus disciples progressively help one another to discover the operations of the Spirit of God within one another and within the community of Jesus. But all of this takes great courage. It requires the cultivation of a spirit of mutuality, trust, and the acquiring of skills that enable the disciples, that enable us to open our lives to one another. It is in this area <coughs> that of the practice of sharing our lives in all beauty and goodness, confusion and failure, and the sharing of the work of the Spirit of God within us, that many times we fail. Formation directors, members of the government of the provinces <coughs> and the order, local fraternities, individual priors, all of us have difficulty putting into practice the call to make our lives ever more transparent to one another. More than one friar who has abandoned the order has made reference to the fact that when they were seeking to live the gospel in their daily lives and in communion with other laity in parishes or lay movements within the church, they experienced a greater willingness of men and women of faith to share what God was doing in their lives with one another. This was not what they experienced in our fraternities, through our prayer, in our formation and other structures of the order, and in our Franciscan religious culture. La ratio colaciones, que ricorda il ruolo fondamentale di evangelizzazione che la fraternità gioca nella vita del frate minore. Leggiamo, la fraternità è il luogo in cui la grazia dello Spirito Santo rende visibile la figura del Cristo di cui ogni fratello porta ad esprimere, ad esprimere una traccia e l'ambiente di riconciliazione e di pace in cui è possibile l'incontro con il Cristo vivo e vero. Come la nostra razza ci ricorda, la fraternità è il terreno in cui coltiviamo la nostra vita con Dio e il posto spirituale e sociale dove facciamo esperienze del, della parola vivente di Dio, vissuta, condivisa, e proclamata insieme la fraterne accesi dello, dello spirito del Dio vivente, o almeno questo è quanto i nostri documenti ci presentano come modello e obiettivo. E la fraternità, l'esperienza vitale di noi e di tutti i ricercatori aperti alle opere dello spirito di Dio, desiderosi di condividere dicendo dicendevolmente storie di fede, di esperienza e d'amore, desiderosi di aprire ad offrire l'uno l'altro la propria vita, con questo in essa di e buon, di cattivo e di brutto, fidandoci dell'irrefrenabile potenza della mis misericordia di Dio, del suo perdono, del suo amore infallibile che opera nei fratelli. In questo terreno fertile noi siamo chiamati ad affidare tutta la nostra vita come un dono ricevuto 
un dono offerto prima di tutto a Dio e poi con grande coraggio e speranza a ciascun fratello in fraternità. La fraternità è il massimo dono che Dio ha dato a noi, fratti minori, proprio perché nella fraternità e attraverso di essa scopriamo e, se necessario, recuperiamo un'autentica visione di Dio. Attraverso la fraternità possiamo costantemente rinnovare il nostro impegno a vivere il Vangelo in totale abbandono. Tutta la formazione permanente e iniziale ha luogo in un contesto di fraternità, come leggiamo nella razione. Alla luce di questo principio fondamentale vorrei aggiungere che tutta la formazione è collaborativa. Non è mai il lavoro di una singola persona, indipendentemente dal livello di conoscenza e di esperienza che essa abbia accumulato. La formazione per sua natura e logica interna è un processo di collaborazione. Si tratta di fratelli che sono irresponsabili, che, corresponsabili, che lavorano insieme per compiere il mandato affidato loro dall'ordine, dalla provincia e dai fratelli in ogni entità, che possono aiutarci a vicenda, a vicenda per rafforzare e approfondire le abilità richieste per servire i fratelli nella formazione permanente e iniziale. Si tratta di fraternità formativa, dove tutti i frati sono respons responsabili di tutta la formazione, con compiti specifici per quelli cui è affidato un, man un mandato specifico. Si tratta di fratelli che sono i destinatari del servizio fraterno di formazione e che sono i principali protagonisti e collaboratori che si aiutano l'uno l'altro per facilitare l'apertura al processo di conversione e trasformazione permanente. Si tratta di province che collaborano tra loro e non si limitano più a coltivare il proprio porticello e capiscono riconoscono ormai solo la comune identità di fratti minore, l'unico e solo Vangelo regola costituzione di vita e il dinamismo dello Spirito di Dio, il quale ci dice che è tempo di superare le nostre mentalità provinciali e far sì che le cose avvengano oltre i confini provinciali e perfino oltre quelli di una conferenza. Forse dovremmo addirittura cominciare a pensare a una formazione permanente e iniziale anche oltre i confini dell'obbedienza, promuovendo programmi condivisi con le altre famiglie francescane. Questo sarebbe rivoluzionario. Well, the Christian community of St. Luke, it is Jesus, the resurrected Messiah, who comes in an unrecognizable form and whose identity and presence can only be revealed through the breaking of bread, the sharing of stories of faith, the communication of life. It is only when they gathered around the table and shared bread and wine, symbols of the banquet of life, that the disciples recognized Jesus for all that he had been for them. But each step of the process, each stage of the dialogue shared between disciples and master prepared for them, prepared them for what they would progressively come to recognize, the living presence of God, once again fully revealed to them in a community of love, a community open to the transcendental experience of God, through the deepening of the formative experience of encounter, dialogue, self-revelation, and mutual discovery. Aflame with the Spirit of God, these Emmaus disciples 
and indeed the members of the Lukin community, Christian communities, could once again set out on the gospel journey of faith, creating opportunities to pray and discern together the work of God in their midst, developing methods and strategies to ensure the ongoing conversion, transformation, and renewal of their lives both individually and collectively and the renewal of their sense and commitment to communion and mission. It is precisely this process of renewal of purpose and of commitment that defines our life as Friars Minor, and that provides the content and the objectives of all formative processes within the order. This content, these objectives include reclaiming anew the identity of the gospel life, of the Friars Minor, living out of a deeply personal experience of encounter with the living God within the context of an evangelical fraternity, going about the world as miners and pilgrims, practicing justice and becoming instruments of reconciliation, dialogue, and peace renewing ourselves and one another through a continuous process of conversion through ongoing formation and promoting among ourselves an insatiable desire to go out and share the good news of what God is doing among us to participate in the evangelizing mission of the Lord Jesus who is called the church and the order to become living witnesses to the resurrection, authentic Emmaus disciples. At all stages of the formative process, we must work harder to integrate all of these dimensions, these five priorities, to integrate them more deeply into our lives and into our structures and practices. We must learn how to engage the five priorities simultaneously rather than separating, separating them in specific, oftentimes disintegrated categories. The Emmaus encounter in Luke's Gospel is of particular relevance to us Friars Minor, who witnessed the decline in the number of men, some young, others slightly yes, less young, who are not coming to us. During a recent visit in Brazil, I found myself speaking with a young man, 27 years old, Kalinde was the place, and he was telling me how excited he was knowing the prize, but also telling me that he could not make a decision with his life. He could not make a decision to commit to anything long-term or permanent. The friars are working on him very diligently. But this is a pro problem that he has, but not only he. I met his two of his sisters, and his sisters were having the same difficulty with their boyfriends. They could not think about making a long-term commitment. You know what I'm talking about because you experience this in the practice of formation in each of your interviews. We also witness the reality of some of our priors, mostly young, but some also middle-aged and occasionally even older priors, who simply leave our way of life. Many of these brothers go to dioceses where they might continue to serve the people of God and the church. Because of this, I have to beg the question, oftentimes we say the crisis of vocation is a crisis of faith. In this case, I don't think it is. It's a crisis of humanity. It's a crisis of fraternity. Perhaps a crisis of authenticity that we must look at internally ourselves and not blame the person who is leaving. We know that the reasons are multiple why people leave. People leave because they struggle with authority. They want greater autonomy, particularly financial or they're simply tired of dealing with others. They want to live independent lives. In all these cases, at some point in the journey, 
our brothers lost their sense of belonging to the brotherhood. This is also something that we must look at in the practice of our formation, developing ways to strengthen our common identity, our bonds as brothers together. There are other reasons I won't list here. I would like also to underscore another troubling area within the larger context of priors leaving the order, and this involves the many lay brothers, not ordained, who are leaving for reasons similar to ordained brothers, but also different from those same brothers. Among the key reasons expressed by lay brothers for leaving the order include, but are not limited to, a lack of development within the order and the church of a positive and integral theology of the vocation of the religious, non-ordained, prior minor. An insufficient or totally non-existent pastoral theology which understands, respects, and promotes lay vocation within the church, providing greater opportunities for the exercise of public ministries that do not absolutely require the presence of a priest. And also some of the other causes and all of the other causes that are related to why ordained brothers plead. Here we find ourselves in the context of discussion about the lay prior leaving before the challenge sometimes of competing visions of the church, of the universal call to holiness, of the particular vocations and ministries within the life of the church, and the practical pastoral applications which oftentimes are rooted more in the vision of individual persons within the church rather than in the fuller theology of the church. We also know that culture plays a role here, general culture and culture within the church. As many of you might know, a special commission or service of fidelity and perseverance has been working very hard since 2009 to understand better the factors contributing to the leaving of the friars from the order. This service will present its findings to the general chapter of 2015 in fulfillment of mandate 48 of the general chapter 2009. I would be remiss if, it, if I did not encourage you who are secretaries of formation or formators to analyze your particular situation, its context, to analyze the changes that are taking place within the local or regional cultures and the church, and to analyze the potential or real impact of these changes on men who are struggling to decide whether or not to join the order, struggling to decide whether to remain in the order. These changes within human societies changes that touch core anthropological understandings of the human person, changes also that challenge traditional forms and norms that undergird the church's understanding of the purpose and ultimate goal of consecrated life, must be thoroughly examined if we are to find a language and propose our way of life to a world that is very much different than that which existed 10, 15, 25, or more years ago. One particular area that requires greater attention and analysis from the perspective of the church and our Franciscan view of the human person and the world, which fundamentally is positive, the goodness present in all created things, this has to do with the communications age. We know, all of us here, some of us have our telephones, our e-books, u-books, i-books. We live at a time, context where human person, the human person has become attached electronically to a worldwide web. This web has great potential for bringing people together and enabling people to develop their God-given talents and to place these talents at the service of humanity and the created universe. At the same time, this same web has the potential to destroy or damage the vision of the goodness and divine future to which humanity and creation are called. 
More recent studies suggest that the Facebook phenomenon, the proliferation of virtual relationships, actually is having a negative impact on the capacity of individuals, particularly those under age 40, to develop the necessary skills for direct face-to-face -face contact and the building of human relationships. We all know of friars or friends, not to say ourselves, who spend more time updating Facebook pages. Some friars have told me three hours, four hours a day. More time at this than they do, than we do, cultivating a spirit of devotion, fraternity, and mission. In some of our houses, the internet is the one common denominator, claiming more and more psychological and social space and time, diminishing the quality of our prayer, common life, and missionary engagement. Please do not misunderstand my reasons for highlighting the potential risks involved in our engagement with the virtual world. Rather, I want to suggest that the church and the order have not yet engaged our resources in a serious analysis of the potential of these new technologies and communications tools that are progressively seizing large swaths of our mental and social space. I would invite this International Congress and all the friars of the order to engage in a serious analysis of the ways we as friars minor might engage with the web, not only benefiting from its potential but also bringing to it our Franciscan vision of the human person so as to promote a realization of the vision that God has for each of us, for all of humanity, and for the created universe. In this way, perhaps we can find ways to evangelize the web, bringing the face of Jesus to Facebook, the power of, gospel, of the gospel to Twitter. Despite the radical nature of Christian conversion, the life-changing events that can lead us to take radical steps to respond to the gospel, as perhaps might have been the case in the lives of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Recent studies have, are suggesting to what, what happens to people when they begin to waver in their vocational commitment, losing passion and desire, and progressively turning to other means in order to complete that which they sense is lacking. Perhaps there are moments in all our lives when these many crises occur, when we no longer sense the support and encouragement of our brothers, superiors, friends, to persevere. Among other possible interpretations, it is becoming ever clearer that we have need to develop and promote processes for self-renewal and the renewal of our fraternities, our entity, and the order. The commodities monk and expert of the study of consecrated life, Father Giovanni del Piaz, who is working with Father Vidal, Father Sergio, and Saparola Friars in Curia, argues that for priests, religious, indeed for all human beings, we are all living much longer lives. Over the course of time, the commitments we make suffer the challenges and consequences of fatigue the challenge of competing possibilities, and the temptation to abandon current commitments with the hope of embracing new ones. There is evidence for this line of interpretation in cases of departure from religious life, the dissolution of marriage after 10 or more years, and the facility of human beings that human beings now have to simply abandon one way of life or profession in order to embrace something entirely different. The same pro professor, Commandantis Monk Dapias, says that what religious life and the church need now more than ever now is a clearer understanding of these dynamics and the courage to create and embrace new methods and new approaches to conversion, transformation, the renewal of religious commitment. He even suggests that perhaps the future of religious life could involve embracing new forms that would allow people to commit to religious life for shorter periods of time and then to move on to other life commitments. I'm only describing to you 
what he has found or what he is discovering in his studies. I don't pretend to fully understand all that is stake, nor do my making reference to these should be in any way interpreted as an endorsement of his opinions. However, his research is, requires and merits further reflection. One final aspect of the formative process that I would like to underscore and encourage is that of the Franciscan vision of the pursuit of studies and intellectual development. As the Ratio Studiorum states, Franciscan studies demonstrates the insatiable desire always to know God more deeply, the depth of light and the fountain of all human truth. Studies not only help us to learn about science and doctrine, but also, and more importantly, to deepen our understanding of truth for the common good, a means by which we might love and praise God, to whom all things belong, and to serve our brothers and sisters with the love of Christ. All intellectual pursuit in the life of the Friars Meyer is placed at the service of the search for truth, the promotion of the gospel, the liberation of the human person and societies from all forms of oppression and destructive economic, technological, and other practices for the evangelizing mission of the church and the order. I conclude this reflection with a quote from the final document of the 2009 general chapter, Bearers of the Gift of the Gospel, where we read, For there to be fire, there must be combustible material, since fire is just the internal energy of the material set free in the form of light and heat. That bonfire that burned in that moment, the lives of the Friar, the lives of the Emmaus apostles, reminds us in symbolic language that there is nothing, nothing, and no one, no matter how dry and dead they may appear, which, when touched by the Spirit of God, is not capable of producing from within itself energy light and heat. The action of the spirit consists especially in freeing the inner potencies of persons and circumstances. Pentecost, and I would add here the entire formative process, means allowing ourselves to be surprised by the unexpected dynamism that lives within us and sends us out two by two on the journey. It needs only a spark to unleash it, a little flame, like that of a candle, the flame of the risen one. The spirit takes charge of the rest. May there be fire on the earth. May there be fire in our formation programs, permanent and initial. May there be fire in our entities, our provinces in the order. And may this fire burn brightly. Happy vacation.
Aquí uso login de Magic Keyboard, me quedé en la página web OSM.org. En vez de diálogo y discusiones, no serán no indirectos. 